All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Have you ever wondered why New England IPAs are almost always seven or eight plus percent ABV and you don't really always see very low ABV versions of them? Well, today we're gonna go ahead and make our own session strength New England IPA. Hey, if it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome. Thank you for checking out this channel. Here on my channel, I'll either make grain to glass videos like the one you are watching right now, or I'll do shorter videos on other various topics in home brewing. If either of those things happen to interest you, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button and hit the like button so you get to see more of this content and more of it from me. Today, I'll be making a hazy New England IPA, but it's not gonna be just another New England IPA. It's a dime a dozen. This is going to be a session strength one, but also it is going to be playing around with a special kind of hop and a special kind of yeast. I am kind of sick and tired of always having to choose seven and 8% beers when I'm trying to drink New England IPAs. It's just nice to have more than two or three beers before you start to really feel it, uh, especially with the hoppy goodness of a New England IPA. Sometimes uh, they catch up to us a little faster than we want them to. So brewing a New England Session IPA or a New England Pale Ale, I don't know how you want to categorize this, um, has been on my radar for some time. But also today we're going to be playing around with a couple new ingredients that, one of which I have used before. Um, the first ingredient is a new hop called Strata. Strata has been around for a couple years now, um, but I've never had the chance to actually brew with it. And today's recipe is going to be inspired by a New England IPA that was actually heavily hopped with Strata, uh, sent to me by a viewer, uh, Nick DeFrancis. Uh, this is your recipe. Um, with a couple tweaks. That beer was very, very good. And ever since I had it, I just kind of made a mental note, I want to make this. So uh, Nick, this is for you. Strata is one of those hops that basically is just built for a New England IPA. It has tons and tons of tropical fruit notes. The second special ingredient that I kind of want to point out in this beer is the yeast. With a New England IPA, you can't go wrong by using the Conan Strain, the Vermont IPA, or using the classic Y-Yeast 1318 London Ale 3, um, or Juice from Imperial. Uh, there's a variety of good strains to use out there that, are, that make great beers. Um, however, one that I haven't tried yet and have wanted to try is Imperial's Dry Hop. Dry Hop is a blend of two other Imperial yeasts. Barbarian, which is the Conan strain, the famous Heady Topper strain, and Citrus, which is actually a Sactois strain. What is Sactois, after all? It's not a yeast that gets talked about all that much, but what it is essentially is a Saccharomyces strain, standard brewer's yeast, uh, that behaves very much like a Britannomyces strain, uh, or a wild yeast that tends to throw out lots and lots of stone fruit and funk. On that note, I'm drinking a Brett Saison here. So this is a beer that I made many months ago um, that has a lot of the wild Brett character in it. And one of those most prominent flavors is like a pineapple stone fruit tartness. That's what the Sactois does without giving you all the phenolics and all of the uh, potential wild yeast uh, sanitation issues that you could get with Brett. Um, and it's also not as funky. It's still gonna retain a lot of that classic brewer's yeast character. So at the end of the day, what you're getting is a yeast that is going to give you a tremendous amount of fruitiness, especially pineapple, uh, when combined with the Conan strain gives you a ton of the classic New England IPA haze and uh, all of the wonderful yeast esters that have come from Conan, um, all together in a package that actually will ferment really well, about 68 to 72, so slightly higher than your typical English strain. So all in one package, this yeast is actually really useful for a New England IPA. I used dry hop before in a classic West Coast IPA and it actually worked out really well. Uh, so I'd love to see how it goes in a typical New England IPA. Before we get too much further into this video, I would like to thank Northern Brewer for providing me the ingredients for this batch of beer and many others before this one. If you haven't heard, Northern Brewer is no longer owned by AB InBev, also known as Anheuser-Busch. They are back to being owned by people that actually care about craft beer and the home brewers. So if you're looking for ingredients or equipment, check them out. Uh, I have a link in the description box, but also if you could just go straight to northernbrewer.com. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about the recipe. So for our grist, we're gonna be using uh, a base of two row. So we'll have seven pounds of pale two row malt. Uh, then we're gonna add a pound and a half each of white wheat and flaked oats into the grist. And that is going to provide a, uh, 
a bit of a mouthfeel boost. So this gives you that soft, pillowy mouthfeel that you would expect from a New England IPA. Uh, but also because it has a ton of protein, these malts are going to contribute to haze and haze stability, is which, which is something that we really want. On top of that, I'm gonna add half a pound of Cara Foam. Uh, this is a malt that I actually have left over from an older brew. That's just gonna boost the head retention a little bit, acting very similar to Cara Pills, and probably will give us a little tiny boost in residual final gravity. Uh, in typical New England IPA style, there is nothing going into the boil. We're actually gonna keep it short. We're gonna do a 30 minute boil. We're gonna do all of our hops in a whirlpool. Uh, so we have two ounces of Strata, one ounce of Cryo Citra, and one ounce of Cryo Mosaic going into the whirlpool. Uh, we're gonna do a 20 minute whirlpool at 180 degrees Fahrenheit to extract some nice juicy flavors. I'm gonna be using those Cryo hops to try and cut down on the amount of plant material in the actual wort. Usually one ounce of cryo hops is about two ounces of regular hops. It just helps a lot to keep hop and plant matter out of your uh, your brew. And also this is a double dry hopped beer. So we're gonna do two dry hopping uh, additions, one at high Krausen and then one after the primary fermentation has finished. The first one will be with one ounce of Strata, one ounce of cryo citra and one ounce of cryo mosaic. Um, and that is going to be at three days into the fermentation to get a high Krausen dry hop to get that bio transformation uh, working on those hops. The second dry hop will be at seven days and it's going to be one ounce of Strata and one ounce of Cryo Citra. We'll talk more about the dry hopping schedule in the fermentation section. Uh, so now on to water. This water profile is going to be very heavy on chloride and calcium. That's going to really help bring out the juiciness of this beer, cut down on that bitterness. We don't want this to be like a West Coast IPA where it's bitter, we just want it to be juicy. Um, and one of the best ways you can make that happen is with the water profile in the beer. Uh, so my water profile is going to be 138 parts per million of calcium, 10 parts per million of magnesium, 39 parts per million of sodium, 251 parts per million of chloride, 112 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, you can copy this water profile for your own brews because I'll be using distilled water. So I'm starting out with a base of zero. I have eight gallons of distilled water going into my claw hammer system, and I'll be adding four grams of gypsum, three grams of epsom, three grams of sodium chloride, and 12 grams of calcium chloride to the mash uh, water before it all starts up, and that will give me the aforementioned water profile. We're gonna mash this at 155 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a high mash temperature so that we can get a decent amount of residual sweetness uh, to balance out all of the hoppiness. This is a session strength beer after all, and it's, it's easy in low ABV beers for the uh, hops to get out of control. So having a little bit of sweetness on the back end is gonna help us out. So everything is all up to temperature now, so let's go ahead and mash in. I added eight gallons of distilled water to my claw hammer supply 120 volt system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature. As it was heating up, I measured out my water salts and added them to the strike water, and I also milled my grain. Once the water reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash. Uh, next, I started recirculating. I let the mash recirculate for about 10 minutes, and then I took a pH reading. I saw a slightly high pH of 5.61, uh, so I added about four milliliters of lactic acid to the mash using a syringe, and that brought the pH down to a much more reasonable 5.39. Also, I added about three grams of ascorbic acid to the mash at this time to scrub any reactive oxygen species from the wort. Uh, ascorbic acid does not really have a tangible effect on mash pH and uh, helps cut down on future oxidation potential. I let the mash sit at 155 Fahrenheit for 60 minutes and then I raised to the mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit. I let it sit there for about 15 minutes and then I pulled out my grain basket and let that drain for another 15 minutes. However, at this point, once the water was underway, I put the controller on 100% power and got a jump start on the boil that way. 
I pulled a sample of work for the pre-boil gravity reading and I recorded a measurement of about 10.2 bricks or 1041, uh, which was five or six points lower than my target pre-boil gravity. Uh, once I reached my boil, uh, it was a 30 minute boil and I actually added nothing. So I let it go for about 15 minutes. I added some yeast nutrient at that point and I let it sit for another 10 minutes until it was five minutes from the end, uh, where at this point I started to recirculate boiling wort through my chilling system to sanitize it. Easiest way to do it and uh, five minutes from the end doesn't have too much impact on your boil. So once I was sure the inside of the chiller and the pump was all sterilized, I then began to reduce to my whirlpool temperature of 180. Uh, then I added my whirlpool hops, two ounces of strata and then one ounce each of the cryo citra and cryo mosaic. I let the whirlpool continue for 20 minutes and then I began to chill to about 70 uh, Fahrenheit. Then I took an OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of about 12.6 bricks or 1049, uh, which was only two points lower than my target. And uh, I began to aerate at that point and pitched my yeast into the fermenter and left it to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, like I said at the beginning of the video, using that Sactois strain mixed with the Conan strain is going to give us the ability to ferment this at a slightly higher temperature uh, than I typically would for a New England IPA. Normally I'm using an English ale yeast like London Ale 3. Uh, that's going to be a little bit better behaving around 63 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, but because of the Sactois I can go all the way up to 68, 70, maybe even a little over 70. Uh, I'm going to shoot for about 68 degrees uh, because that's where I'm comfortable fermenting. If you don't want to use the Sactois strain and you can't find it, um, there's a number of other great yeasts to use. Like I said, 1318, Lenadale 3, uh, or the Conan strain, or you know that's Imperial Barbarian. The uh, Imperial Juice strain as well, which is fantastic uh, for making New England IPA. It's also the same strain as 1318, I think. But if you want to go down the dry yeast route, SO4 from uh, Fermentis is actually a great yeast for this. Just make sure you're fermenting all of those yeasts at a slightly lower temperature than I'm doing in this video. That's gonna pay off a little bit because you're not gonna get as many funky weird esters out of the English strains because uh, they do tend to get kind of weird when they're fermented warmer. Another great alternative yeast to use for this uh, beer is any type of fruity quite strains. Usually the go-to is Voss, but if you get Hornindel hot enough, it'll uh, it'll get fruity as well. If you are using a strain of quite, your fermentation is gonna be a lot faster. So just be sure you adjust your dry hopping schedule accordingly. Might want to look at day one and day four uh, for your dry hopping schedule. The second thing to make sure we talk about here in this section is the double dry hopping schedule. So I am a fan of single dry hopping in New England IPAs because it means less risk of oxidation. New England IPAs are notoriously easy beers to oxidize and if you're not careful oxygen can get into your beer it'll turn it an ugly shade of brown or purple and it will basically get rid of all of the hoppy goodness that you had in the beer to begin with. It's a very sad thing when you spend a ton of money on trendy hops to uh, put into your New England IPAs. Generally the biggest risk for oxidation uh, with them is the second dry hopping stage. The first one, if you're doing it at High Krausen, is a low risk dry hop because you are uh, actively fermenting at that point in time. There's CO2 that is pushing oxygen out of the fermenter, so you have no issues opening up your actual fermenter uh, during this stage. The second stage is where it's risky because at that point, fermentation is slowed down. There's not as much positive pressure from the CO2. That could cause issues. You could drag oxygen into your beer with a dry hopping addition. Primary addition is gonna be easy. I'm just gonna dry hop straight into the fermenter with that one. Uh, but the second dry hopping addition, I'm gonna wanna use something called a hop dropper. Um, I covered how to make that in this video here. If you wanna check that out, um, that is gonna give you a couple different options for oxygen-free dry hopping, but uh, that's gonna be the method of choice for me considering I'm using my conical fermenter. If you don't have a conical, um, which you don't need for this beer at all, um, you can go ahead and use a magnet release uh, kind of dry hopping method. I also covered in that video. So uh, if you're curious about dry hopping, be sure to check that out. This is a great beer to ferment under pressure if you have the uh, ability to do that with a unit tank or with a firmzilla. Uh, just be careful when you are dry hopping under pressure. Um, generally, that is one of the points in time where beer explodes on you. So just make sure you know what you're doing if you're fermenting this one under pressure. Um, but if you do, you're gonna probably lock in a lot of that nice volatile hop aroma uh, and keep that around. The fermentation for this one shouldn't take too long, but it's probably not gonna be as fast as if I was using Quike. Uh, so we'll be looking at probably about 10 
days on this, I think, maybe 10 to 12 days uh, before we go ahead and package. I don't want to leave the dry hops in the beer too long because it can get grassy and we want to avoid that. But on the flip side, we also might have to do it anyway because we have that double dry hop and I might just have to accept that. We'll see how it goes though. I'm going to try and transfer into the keg as soon as I possibly can after the dry hopping steps are done. Um, we might have to let this sit in the keg for a couple days at room temperature uh, to clean up any potential diacetyl that was created through uh, the dry hopping. So there's a phenomenon called hop creep that occurs when you dry hop. Basically, uh, long story short, when you dry hop, there's additional enzymes and additional sugars at play, um, and it causes yeast to re-enter fermentation, uh, and it can cause diacetyl if you don't let the yeast actually uh, clean itself up before cold crashing and packaging. So uh, sometimes rushing IPAs isn't always the best decision. In a nutshell, we are going to ferment this at about 68 degrees. I'm gonna dry hop twice on day three and on day seven. Keg at about day five or so, and then I'm gonna take that uh, keg, let it sit at room temperature for two or three more days to clean up the acetyl. Then we'll hook it up to gas, put it in the keyser, get it all ready to be served. The beer will be probably ready in about two weeks, maybe two and a half weeks. So I will catch you guys at that point in time. Final Gravity is coming in at a nice solid 10.14, uh, which means that it definitely was a temperature calibration issue I was dealing with before. 10.14 is a great Final Gravity for this style of beer. All right, so the fermentation on the beer actually went really, really well overall um, because I actually properly calibrated my claw hammer controller. I mashed at the temperature that I was actually intending to mash at, not three degrees or four degrees lower, so I ended up with a proper Final Gravity. Yay. So the fermentation lasted for about 12 days overall, and that included the dry hopping steps, the double dry hop. So one of the reasons why I use my conical is because I can actually hook up a CO2 line to the input on the bottom of the fermenter and bubble CO2 up through the beer, actively pushing oxygen out of the fermenter uh, during the dry hopping step, which allows me to open the fermenter entirely without risk of oxidation. And because of that, I just used a dry hopping bag both times, um, and I just opened up the fermenter uh, to add the bag with that CO2 pushing uh, out actively. And every time that I've used that as a dry hopping method, I've never had any oxidation issues. I actually kegged last night and I got it carbonated up overnight um, and we are ready to go right now. It had a lot of hot burn initially, but I put a floating dip tube in my keg and um, now I have a hop filter on the end of that floating dip tube as well. So that actually cuts down a lot on the overall hop particulates that get into the beer. And that means that you get a lot less of that hop burn uh, character that is uh, an aggressive harshness at the back of your throat when you're drinking too young of a beer. But this beer is absolutely delicious and I can't wait to share it with you. So we're gonna go ahead and pour that now and uh, talk about it outside. Even though it's a little chilly, I'm still excited to, uh, to share it with you. All right, so the beer is called Haze for Days and it comes in at 4.6% ABV and 42 IBUs. The appearance of the beer is a really nice, opaque, very hazy uh, appearance. It's a very pale yellow in color and has a really good white fluffy head on it. The head retention is pretty good and uh, I'm overall very happy with the way that it turned out. While it is definitely still a little bit colder today, I didn't want to uh, just give up and start going inside for my tastings just yet, because uh, it's only November. So we are outside today. But yeah, let's talk about aroma of the beer next. The aroma is very powerful. Well, it's a double dry hop beer. I mean, that's kind of what you would expect. I'm getting like a very sweet kind of melony uh, character. I think there's also a lot of berries coming out of this one. Um, there's also a sweet orange character as well uh, that is really pretty strong in the aroma. Um, <clears throat> it's a really nice aroma overall. It's, it's very fruity, it's very tropical, uh, exactly what you would expect for something like this. But the nice thing about it is that it's really not any different than the aromatics you would get out of a stronger New England IPA, um, which is really nice. Whether it's like 6%, 7%, 8 plus percent hazy, it doesn't really matter. It's got the same character as all of those, uh, which is pretty great for a little package like this. So now let's talk about mouthfeel. 
So the mouthfeel on this one is a little bit off the mark, actually. It's definitely creamy. It's definitely got that, uh, that kind of silkiness, but it's not really as full, um, I think, as I would have liked. And that's probably due to the lack of overall alcohol content. That's something I probably should have compensated for uh, when designing this recipe. It's definitely acceptable. It's just a little bit less than I wanted, I think. Um, it is also a little bit heavy on the minerality. And while that does boost the overall mouthfeel characteristics of it, um, it does make it a little bit flinty, um, <laughs> which is not really what I was going for. Um, so that's definitely something to put down as something to change about this recipe should you want to brew it yourself. I would go with something a little bit less minerally. The carbonation level is definitely right on point, it's not too high. Um, I kind of put this one a little bit lower than your standard uh, two and a half volumes. It's like 2.3, um, so that you get a little bit more of that smoothness, and that helps a lot too, because if you over carbonate a New England IPA, you're gonna lose a lot of that mouthfeel and a lot of that, uh, that fullness. So now the section you've all been waiting for, flavor. <sighs> this is, basically like drinking a cup of juice. It's definitely one of the juicier hazy IPAs that I've made. And I really have to credit the uh, intensity of the cryo hops and um, of course the you know excellent flavor of the Strata for this. Strata is kind of like uh, a hop that is somewhat purpose built for New England IPAs. And I will say that this hop combination is really good. Um, there's a really huge amount of melon and guava flavor in this. It's very tropical overall. Um, a lot of hazies sometimes just tend to be like one-dimensional orange tangerine flavor. This doesn't have that. This has a whole lot more going on. So we've got like melon, I've got guava. There is definitely still a lot of orange and tangerine character in this, but it's just one part of an otherwise larger palette of flavors. Um, there's also a lot of grapefruit here, and there's enough hops in this to make it slightly bitter. Um, it's not nearly as bitter as it would have been if I had uh, encouraged sulfates in the water profile, but it is still reasonably so bitter. But I think a lot of that is also coming from hot burn. The other really cool note in this, and this is 100% due to strata, is that there is a berry character as well, layering everything. And I got that in the aromatics, but also it's in the flavor. Now, a lot of people cite this as strawberry when they're talking about strata, but I'm not really getting the strawberry. It's more like a raspberry. Um, but it layers in really nicely with the other fruity flavors, uh, and I really find that I enjoy it. And yes, there's a little bit of hot burn in this. Um, this is still relatively fresh. I mean, it's a New England IPA. You'll want to drink it fresh. You don't want to sit on it. Straight out of the fermenter, this thing was borderline undrinkable because of how much hot burn it had. Uh, but adding that hop filter really cuts down on the uh, overall particulates, and that's kind of where you get a lot of that from. Um, and it's, it's really a lot nicer now. This is also a great fall slash winter IPA. Like these, these tend to do really, really well this time of year because they're just more substantial. Even if this example doesn't have the alcohol content of many others, that full bodiedness kind of gives you that idea that it's stronger than it is. But there's a tremendous amount of flavor going on in this. It's very, very fruity, uh, very juicy, but in a four and a half percent package, it's really quite good. I do kind of wish there was a bit more maltiness in it. Thankfully, because I calibrated my thermometer um, in the Clawhammer system, this has a much more appropriate final gravity for the style uh, 1014. It gives you a little residual sweetness in there. Um, and there's not as much maltiness coming out. It, it is very much um, kind of your basic white bready kind of uh, sort of, um, I don't know, semi-sweet maltiness that's that's really there for our base malt, um, but nothing really beyond that in complexity, and I think I would have liked a little bit more complexity. So moving on to the potential improvement section, of course, we talked about water profile earlier, so I think I would like to make that water profile a little less overall minerally, lower that calcium content a little bit, uh, lower the chloride content a little bit, and lower the sulfate content uh, primarily. Beyond that, so you really, you really do want to maintain a high chloride to sulfate ratio um, and within that, but maybe make it a little less overall minerally. Uh, the other thing too is I would like to add a little bit of um, more complexity to the malt base, so maybe a Golden Naked Oats edition. I want to start using those in hazies. Uh, a lot of people talk about that in a very good way, but also maybe some toasted oats. You know, something to bring in a little bit of toastiness, a little bit of something additional in the malt palette to make this um, a little bit more complex on the malt side. 
Beyond that, I wouldn't change anything about the hops. These hops work beautifully together, um, and having those cryo hops really helps limit the amount of plant material in the fermenter. I had no issues transferring. I had no clogged poppet valves anywhere. And of course, I use hop bags to contain my dry hops with in the fermenter. But beyond that, it really does give you a lot more hop character for the amount of material you're actually putting in the beer. It's very nice to have a hazy that you can have more than a few of before you start to feel the alcohol. Um, and that's a good thing in my book. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something and found it useful. And if you did, please hit that like button and please subscribe if you haven't already. If you want to support the channel, I didn't wear any of my merch in this video actually, but um, I do have a bunch of t-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, pine glasses, cool stuff like that down below the description box if you want to check those out. It's a great way to support the channel. I get about 50% of those profits. In addition to that, I also have my Patreon page, which is linked in the description box. Uh, Patreon is a great way for you to support me on a personal basis. If you feel so inclined, there's no obligation to do so whatsoever, but the Patreon is the literal core of supporting this channel. The Patreon supporters are the people that have enabled me to get better filming and audio and lighting equipment and they've made a huge difference to the channel and I'm very appreciative of that. There's also an Amazon store that I have in the description box where uh, you can check out some of my favorite recommended equipment. Everything on that store is something that I personally recommend and actually kind of endorse basically because I've used it for most of my brewing. Um, and I wouldn't really put anything on that store that I don't personally recommend. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also available on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer. Uh, so check that out if you want to see slightly more frequent content updates. So if you're still watching at this point, you either forgot to click out of the video or you're intent on actually watching the whole thing. So either case, I really do appreciate the watch time and it matters quite a bit. So this one is for you guys. So until the next time, cheers. <laughs>